Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much, Louise and uh, Bridie. Bridie, yeah. And uh, especially also Elena, who's not here, but has a baby, and that's why she's not here. Uh, and I'm also very happy to see some friends who I know well, and I'm particularly delighted to see a cousin of mine who I have not seen for many, many years. I don't even want to say how many. Uh, and I mean, you know, we stop counting at a specific point. Uh, also, it's been, uh, it's, I think, a very timely point in time to talk about the topic which uh, Louise mentioned, the politics of fear. Uh, it seems to be the case that uh, this kind of right-wing, far-right, right-wing populist politics is extraordinarily successful across Europe, but also beyond. Uh, and in my book, which uh, you mentioned, which uh, was published 2015, I still didn't cover Trump. Uh, and I didn't cover Brexit. And I didn't cover IFD in Germany. Uh, so now the publishers said, well, you have to write a second edition because, you know, there are so many new things have happened uh, ever since. And uh, I thought, well, if I would write a second edition, I could add a chapter every day. So I, I think I'll wait a bit and then maybe things have changed uh, in one way or the, the other. But it's obviously a topic which is so big and so strong right now, which I hadn't imagined when I wrote the book. Uh, quite in, in the con contrary, when I wrote the book, uh, it was kind of, well, I'm leaving university now. It's the time when you write your sort of almost final book. You bring together a lot of research which you've done. And uh, yeah, and then you go home, right? And uh, uh, what happened was the book was published in September 2015. And that was about three weeks before an election in Vienna. Uh, I live in Austria, and that election was seen as a tipping point between the Austrian Freedom Party and uh, the Social Democratic Party in Vienna. Vienna is a red-green town, and the Austrian Freedom Party is very strong. Right now, it's also part of the government. You can ask me a lot later on. I won't talk about Austria that much, uh, otherwise I'll be very unhappy. Uh, so, um, suddenly that book became the center of attention uh, because everybody wanted to know why is it so that these parties with these messages have so much resonance. And that's actually what I would like to talk about uh, today or this evening and pick your brains afterwards and I know Benjamin has written a lot about that as well. So there are many people here who can add. Uh, we, I would like to discuss why this kind of rhetoric and this kind of persuasive communication is so successful. And of course, it's not only the form, it's the contents as well. So it's a, always, as in linguistics, we talk about the combination of form and content, so that's what interests me. It's not just performance, it's not just rhetoric, it is a lot of content, and we need to understand what kind of contents are conveyed. And more specifically, I would like to discuss the issue of lies. Uh, why do people believe in lies? Uh, and this is not at all a new phenomenon in uh, politics at all. Uh, I've brought with me, uh, and obviously I don't show slides today, but to remind you of uh, Trump's inauguration. Uh, and if you envisage Trump's inauguration uh, and the people listening and coming there, uh, he afterwards uh, stated that there were more people there than at Obama's inauguration. And again, I'm sure you might remember the picture where everything was full, the mall was full. 
uh, whereas at Trump's inauguration, there were fewer people, and it was obvious. Uh, nevertheless, Trump uh, stated that never had there been so many people at an inauguration as at, as at his inauguration. And uh, then when asked in television, and I brought this specific uh, debate, uh, his secretary or PR person, Kelly Conway, uh, whose face you might also remember from CNN and other television, was asked, uh, how come that he is stating that there are more people than with Obama? And Conway said, you're saying it's a falsehood. And Sean Spice, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. And the interviewer says, alternative facts are not facts. They are falsehoods. So Conway says, if you're going to keep referring to the press secretary in those types of terms, I think we're going to have to rethink our relationship here. So what happens in this very brief sequence, and I think it's also linguistically very interesting, is the reformulation and redefinition of truth and facts. Now this is, as I said, not new. Hannah Arendt, many years ago, gave lectures, which were then also translated into German, about truth and lies in politics. Uh, I don't know if you've read those lectures. I can recommend them a lot because they are really a wonderful read. Uh, and she wrote one of those essays after the Pentagon Papers were published in the Washington Post, where there's also a film now with Meryl Streep, if, which is very good. And uh, so um, Hannah Arendt at that time said, it's very interesting how facts become opinions. And when facts become opinions, they have a different truth value, and then uh, you can kind of contrast opinions with each other. Yeah? So there are my opinions and your opinions and excess opinions, but we are not talking about facts and evidence and proof anymore. And this is exactly what we are reliv reliving right now, is that there are many opinions. Yeah? There are different opinions about climate change. There's your opinion, my opinion, and uh, people don't care if 99% uh, of the scholars say there is climate change. Right-wing populists still deny climate change. Mr. Trump denies climate change. The Austrian Freedom Party denies climate change and so forth. And uh, the same is true with many other issues uh, of our lives, uh, that suddenly facts have become opinions. And once they become opinions, you know, they have become much more volatile than facts used to be. Another thing which Hannah Arendt, then she wrote a second essay, which I also recommend about the same issues, truth and lies in politics, and that she wrote that after the Watergate affair. So she was very much in touch, of course, with the American politics. And if you remember, Nixon resigned before he was impeached uh, with Watergate, and that became also a very big worldwide affair. And uh, then she wrote about uh, who really has power in politics and who uh, determines what is true and false. And then she comes up with uh, a claim that the experts are to blame in some way, that there is a new sort of group of experts uh, who are sort of employed by various governments or sort of po political parties and who then drive the discussion. Uh, something which all of us, and especially in Brussels, probably know very well, 
there are all kinds of experts who are lobbying and also positioning themselves and who basically are not really scholars, yeah, because they don't retain their independence in, in that way. Uh, so Hannah Arendt was very much forward-looking and quite prophetic about what we are experiencing now. And the third point she makes there is about spin doctors. And she sees experts and spin doctors quite close to each other. And she says, well, basically, uh, at that time, that was in the 60s, yeah, Watergate. Uh, at that time, uh, and in the 70s, um, that the spin doctors decide how politicians and what they should communicate. And uh, in that way, uh, there are no real ideologies over there. There's a lot of marketing. Well, what we see right now is really a comm commodification of politics, as I would call it. Uh, and that is specifically true in the United States, because only if you have a lot and lot and lots of money, you can really do politics. But uh, politicians uh, are less independent than they were. There is a lot of going on about money and uh, about the commodification, and parties also commodify themselves uh, with websites and Facebook, and you can buy Trump caps and Strache, who's the leader of the Austrian Freedom Party t-shirts and so forth. So there is this whole marketization, commodification of politics which is happening, and that has a lot to do with my question of truth and lies because obviously many insights of advertising and marketing are dominating politics, and uh, politicians have become in many ways uh, products of such uh, marketing and spin doctors, the way they move, the way they act in television. If you're not a media personality, you can't even think of standing as a uh, election or a candidate for election. And that is one factor why Donald Trump is so successful, or also Berlusconi. Uh, they know how to sell themselves very well, and especially Trump, who had been an entertainer, uh, knew exactly how to play this role. And I think it's very strategic in the way this is also performed. But to come back to those lies and alternative facts, there's another example I would like to share with you, and that was the Brexit, typical Brexit campaign. Uh, you as British know that well. Um, these big red buses uh, going around London and elsewhere with the Brexit campaign saying 350 uh, million pounds a week uh, are paid by the British government to the EU. Now, and if uh, Britain uh, leaves the EU, so exits, uh, then these 350 million pounds a week, which are paid, will stay in Britain, and they will be used for the British health system. So that was sort of the big promise. So there was a lot of uh, scaremongering, yeah, sort of how terrible that is, uh, all this uh, money which is taken away from Britain, the big danger with all those migrants and so forth. And once they take back control, that was the other uh, big slogan, taking back control on a national level, uh, taking back this money, then Britain will be saved. And that was basically the argumentative pattern which was conveyed in this campaign. Uh, it turns out, of course, that there was never 350 million pounds a week which was paid to the EU. Uh, it was much less, 160 million pounds, and uh, also Britain always got money back. They had a very special deal, a deal which nobody else had and which they will probably never get again. Uh, and uh, also, there, no money was put into the health system, and the health system is very volatile right now in Britain. 
and the, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, so the social gap cleavage is getting much bigger. And uh, uh, as you all know, the negotiations, nobody really knows where they're going to. So there was again this big lie. Uh, that was put forward specifically by Boris Johnson, the former mayor of London, but also other uh, ministers now in the Theresa May government. And now comes my big question. Even though we all know that this is wrong, that these were lies, uh, and there are many other, of course, examples I could list, although we all know that, Boris Johnson is foreign minister of the UK and um, Trump is the president in the United States and it seems as if it doesn't matter. So why is that so? Because it used to be the case that lies mattered. Yeah, if politicians were caught with such big lies, they had to resign or they lost elections. There is this famous example of Bush father who said, read my lips, there will be no more taxes. He promised that, the promise was broken, and he lost. Yeah, and that was a big thing in the election campaign, and there are many other examples. So it seems it doesn't matter. And so I put forward this claim now I've written several papers now also about this, that not only are we living in a post-truth era, this is constantly post-factual, post-truth, and so forth, I claim that we're actually living in a post-shame era. Uh, because you can be shameless, yeah? It just doesn't matter, yeah? Uh, anything goes to quote firearms, it just doesn't matter. Uh, and the question is, why does that work so well? So if we think a bit about what, uh, what are the constituents of right-wing populism on the one hand, and I, I won't now discuss the term, I know there are big debates about should we call it radical right, far right, populism, uh, so I just use this term now as a covered term except for really parties with paramilitary groups like Jobbik or Golden Dawn in Greece, so they would be extreme right, neo-Nazis, uh, something else. Um, so uh, why does that work so well? And uh, what populism, this right-wing populism, I think have four dimensions content-wise and then specific rhetorical means to convey them. Uh, one is a really violent nationalism or even nativism. That means blood and soil ideologies are back. Uh, you find that scalar, some less, parties less, some more. If we look to Hungary right now, you have it in evidence. Uh, and uh, also in Poland, it's very strong, which means that only people who are born there for generations are the real Hungarians or uh, Finns or yeah, uh, Brits or whatever. Uh, and uh, these, these, this is defined also territorially, which is why borders have become so important again. So we have this body, this nation, uh, and uh, there are these true people living there, and we define these uh, party leaders and these parties define arbitrarily who belongs to those people and who doesn't. And that can shift, yes, yeah? that can... So basically, for example, uh, in the... Uh, Alternative für Deutschland, yeah, the IFD in Germany, said Muslims don't belong to Germany. Uh, the same Norbert Hofer, the presidential candidate in Austria who lost, said the same. So certain people, just per definition, don't belong, others belong. Uh, and you have constant new definitions, membership categorizations of who belongs and who doesn't belong to the people, which are seen as a homogeneous collective. Yeah? 
and uh, these parties then stand for these people. Uh, and that's interesting because even if those leaders are elites, yeah, and they come from the elites or are very rich or also intellectuals or whatever, they are not seen as parts of these elites. So the world is mapped into not just us and them, yeah, that's of course the major dichotomy, but there are different them. Yeah, and I think it's interesting to look at the mindset, yeah, how this is cognitively mapped. Uh, who are the strangers and who are us? And you have them inside the country. Those are the elites, the bad elites, the establishment, the journalists, the liberals, the intellectuals, the opposition parties. You can add to that certain minorities, like the Muslims, the Jews, the Roma, whoever is targeted. Uh, then there are others outside of the country. Those are the migrants and the refugees, so they are very dangerous. And then there are others who are below, and those are the poor. Yeah? Those are the beggars, uh, people who are they claim abuse the system, uh, those who uh, are not really efficient, who don't work enough, who don't achieve enough. And so basically you have this image, which uh, if you can imagine that, of here are we and we are encircled. Yeah? There are people coming from outside who are dangerous, there are people above who are dangerous, and there are people below who are dangerous. So what do we do? We have to fight. And uh, the us has to protect themselves. So those parties can come and say, we will protect you. We will save you. We will make you great again. Yeah? We will get rid of all those threats. And in that way, after constructing the sphere, which is coming from all sides, uh, they construct hope. And they promise that they will save you. And of course, again, this is not a rhetorical figure which is new, that has been used rhetorically, I think, probably since antique times. And if you read Mein Kampf as well, you will find it there. So, uh, but this figure seems to resonate very well. Yeah, so we will come now and save you, I, Trump, or um, Strache, or uh, Nigel Farage, or whoever, uh, is going to come and save. And that means we have detected and uh, found out who is to blame for all these problems, all these dangers coming from all sides, so we have to get rid of them. And it's very interesting if you read uh, the newest opinion polls and surveys by the Bertelsmann uh, Stiftung. Uh, they put out EU opinions uh, from time to time and have very interesting surveys. And they had a survey a year ago of nine European countries, member states, uh, Hungary, Austria included, and others, uh, Spain, Portugal, France, Germany, uh, and so forth. Uh, and uh, they asked what people are mostly frightened of. And so the basic answer was globalization. So globalization as become this enormous threat. So then they asked, well, what is globalization? So what do you mean by globalization? And uh, they you know, listed several things which people might be frightened of, and I think all of us are. Yeah? War, climate change, financial crisis, this, that, and the other. And both left wing and right wing, young and old, were quite similar in their frequencies in their answers. But there was one issue which was so threatening uh, for sort of people affiliated to right wing and far right, and that's migration. So globalization means migration. It doesn't mean climate change. It doesn't mean financial crisis, all the 
big things, it means migration. So it's really reduced to one phenomenon and there the differences between more progressive urban people and uh, rural elderly people, people with more education, people with less education, young and old, yeah, there are various uh, dimensions, is enormous. And that explains why the issue of strangers yeah, and these threats and migration are emphasized and instrumentalized so much by these parties. It works. And uh, it works even though all of us know that, uh, of course, there are terrorists coming in as well, but there are terrorists living here as well. Uh, although all of us know that there's a lot of exaggeration, that now there are much less refugees, etc., etc., that is the issue which is being instrumentalized. And if you look at the recent Hungarian election, and I was in Hungary, in Budapest three weeks ago for a week at the Central European University giving a block seminar, uh, and you see those posters of Soros everywhere, and uh, it was a horrible, horrible campaign. Uh, it was led on the issue of immigration, although there are no immigrants in Hungary. And uh, the same is true in Poland. Poland took on nine refugees, I think. Uh, all in all, 2015, Austria took in 90,000. Yes, just to give you sort of some perspective. But that works. That is the basic fear which is exaggerated, instrumentalized, created, and so forth. And I would like to give you another example because the talk was also advertised as talking about Trump. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of talk about fences, borders, and walls. I mean, not just quote unquote fortress Europe, which is actually a term which was basically coined in Nazi times and then recontextualized by the Allies and then used in the Cold War and in many other arenas. But we are obviously now experiencing a language about walls. Yeah? Everything is about how to protect this national body, yeah? this important dimension. And uh, I want to just read you something about this Trump's case uh, about the walls because it makes very clear how he actually defines this danger. And what Trump says, and I, I looked at several of his speeches and he always repeats himself, yeah? So he has quite a small lexicon if you <laughs> think of it, uh, which is one of his I think uh, really big resources, yeah? I mean, we might think it's, you know, restricted code if we think of sociolinguistics in the, in the 1970s, but people have the feeling he talks like us, yeah? He's authentic. He's not talking down to them, he talks to them. He talks our language, doesn't use abstract terms, he doesn't use uh, difficult, uh, arguments, yeah, it's short sentences, it's to the point, it's repetitive, you know, it's conversational. And that is very, very important from a linguistic point of view. So he talks like we do and he doesn't talk down to us, he's not patronizing. That's what you hear from many people. So Trump's case for building a wall and I looked at many of his speeches and there evolves a pattern. And the, the first we have, we have illegal immigrants. Now illegal immigrants is a very interesting sort of collocation as we call it when words always come together because the question is what is an illegal immigrant? Is it somebody who's smuggled in or is it somebody who just crosses the border? or they have no visa, no passport. It's become a term which is being used now 
basically for refugees and all migrants. If you look at the program, the government program of the Austrian government, now you find the term illegal migrants used for refugees, for economic migrants, for all, everybody coming in. Yeah? So it has become a cover term for stranger. So Trump says, we have illegal immigrants who are being taken care of better than our incredible veterans. People flow through like water. So this is a very uh, frequent metaphor used when, in combination with migration, natural catastrophes. Uh, where you're completely helpless, those catastrophes happen, like tsunamis or you know, big waves, they just swamp you, and there's nothing you can do, and you're the victim. They are not the victims, the refugees, but we are the victims, yeah? and they invade us. So you have this war metaphor as well. So then comes the second uh, position in this argument, the second move, and he says, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best people. They're sending, you know, the criminals, or they're sending us not the right people. So the question is, who would those right people be? They're sending people through they don't want. So they're getting sort of rid of the people they don't want, and they send them to the States. When Mexico sends its people, they're sending people that have lots of problems take our jobs and then we pay them interest. It's going to get worse and worse. So he creates this group, yeah? linguistically he constructs this group of very dangerous bad people. Yeah? So uh, they have lots of problems, they are not the right people, etc. And then he takes a third move and says ISIS authorizes such atrocities as murders against non-believers. And you think, why is he suddenly talking about ISIS? Yeah? ISIS is not coming from Mexico. Uh, ISIS is somewhere else, yeah? even if maybe he doesn't have the world map in his, before him, but it's not causally linked to the Mexicans. But it's also a dangerous group. So he says, ISIS authorizes such atrocities as murders against non-believers, beheadings, and unthinkable acts that pose great harm to Americans, especially women. They want to kill us. These are people who don't want our system. They don't want our system and have no sense of reason or respect for human life. So this is, in, as a pattern, comes after the construction of the negative group of Mexicans. So you have a second negative group, and basically when you listen to this, they merge. So the Mexicans might also murder us, they are also dangerous for our women, uh, and even if ISIS is somewhere else, you know, all of them are just dangerous. Yeah? And then comes another move which I find interesting, uh, and I'm just trying to find this page where he continues and then says, here it is, we are out of control. So after having described sort of what the danger, he goes back to us and says, we're out of control. We have no idea if they love us or hate us. We have no idea if they want to bomb us and it's got to stop and it's got to stop fast. So this uh, sort of mantra of getting control back is something which we all know very well from the Brexit campaign and which is the renationalizing issue. Sort of taking our powers back from Brussels, which is always used metonymically as the EU, and taking those powers back to our nation state. So we have to take control back and the U.S. has to take control back to make America great again. So we have to be vigilant. We have, and now comes the fourth move, what do we do? We have tremendous eyes and ears. We have millions and millions and millions of eyes and ears. So you know his exaggeration and repetitions. 
database is okay and watching them is okay and surveillance is okay. I want to know who they are. So he promises. Yeah, he will sort of, we will watch, we will have all these interesting ways of surveillance and then Trump will know who they are and he will protect us. Yeah? And then comes sort of the conclusion of the argument, to make the country strong we have to stop the border. We have to establish borders, we have to build a wall. We have to and we will. And this is sort of the remedy now against all these dangers. And then he concludes at all these speeches, you can't be great if you don't have a border. And that is sort of linked to the general motif yeah, and promise to make America great again. And now that is linked into this general campaign, making borders and building walls and protecting all of us against those people from Mexico, but also ISIS, that sort of will make us safe and that will make America great again. And it's very uh, simple argument, but it's extraordinarily powerful. And if you hear that again and again, and we know rhetorically repetition is a very important figure, then that works very well. So this is sort of the figure of the savior and I want to come back to my question why these lies work and why such rhetoric resonates so well. Apart from creating fear, hope is created and specifically via authentic language or seemingly authentic language and performance plus entertainment with Trump and I think he's very similar to Berlusconi actually, who also has that. Um, there is an issue of anti-elitist and anti-establishment rhetoric in there. And that's a very important point, the populist point, of we against those in Washington. And in that way he forms a unity with those people who uh, complain and probably legitimately frequently complain that they are not listened to, they are not heard, their voices are not there. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot going on with small uh, towns which have lost all their industry and so forth and everything is centered in this capital and uh, nobody speaks to them. And in the way that he provides this anti-establishment, anti-elitist rhetoric, he's bonding with those people and what uh, other researchers, especially psychologists claim, uh, he is empowering them. Yeah? He gives them back a voice and uh, also takes away shame. Why are these people ashamed? Because they don't achieve anything anymore. And in the United States where, and in neoliberal countries where you have to constantly achieve something, that is bad. Yeah? If you're unemployed, it's bad, yeah? and so forth. So suddenly somebody tells them, you don't have to be ashamed, you know. The guilty ones are those, 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 and I will make you great again. I will give you all that back again. You're not to blame. It's not your fault that all of this doesn't look good for you. And because of creating such a bond, they just believe it. And uh, whatever is said in the news is part of these elites. So if the elites say this, it's fake. And you don't have to believe it. And so suddenly we have the construction, really, I think, of parallel discourse worlds where and uh, everybody who lives in the States or has been there experiences that people cannot talk to each other anymore because they seem to be living in different worlds uh, and also experiencing different events and uh, sort of are, there's almost no possibility of uh, argument or dialogue anymore. And I think this is what is extraordinarily dangerous also in European societies um, 
I, and one thing in which I would like to conclude with, because I know I always talk too much. Um, one thing I would like to conclude with is what do we do? Yeah, so I, I don't have recipes and linguists don't have those kinds of recipes and I don't think it's only a question of framing and language at all. Yeah? I think it's a question of providing, apart from confronting enormous problems like youth unemployment, uh, which I think is the biggest problem of, uh, apart from climate change which we are confronting, uh, we have to create public spaces where uh, people can be empowered to participate, but then that doesn't sort of vanish into some kind of drawer somewhere in some bureaucrat's office. But like in Ireland, which I think is a wonderful model, those citizen assemblies are really listened to because their recommendations get into parliament and they have to be discussed. So it's not a referendum where it's either or, and if you're tired this day you will say no, and if you feel good you will say yes, some sort of, I'm very opposed to such referenda. But it's a participation of one year dealing with complex issues in Ireland, abortion or gay marriage, yeah, which are very difficult and sensitive issues, and uh, people are, chosen by lottery, so there is no subjective selection by profession or education or age or gender. They are put together, 100 people, and they continue a discussion for a year. And they can invite experts and all kinds of help, and they write recommendations, and they are involved in the decision procedure. And the feedback which you get from people who have been involved, it's like jurors, yeah, who you're chosen by lottery, is fabulous, yeah, because for the first time people say, I participated, I'm being taken serious, I can say what I think, this first time I've met a woman who had an abortion, it's the first time I've ever talked to somebody who's a stranger or something, and it uh, has really changed a lot in the political communication and political sphere, and I think that that is one way to go, apart from many other ways, is to enable different kinds of participation and not just go on complaining that, or saying we have to listen and we have to take them seriously. Well, then do it, yeah? Uh, it's not a question of always thinking about it, but actually also implementing it. And I would like to stop here seeing Louise's signs, yeah, getting nervous, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.